This is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, July 11th, 2024. OGM means open global mind. Um, and as I just explained, we alternate formats. Some weeks uh, we have a topic and we dive in. Other weeks we do check-ins and we go around the room and see what is on people's minds that has to do with OGM-like activity. Um, and that is this week. So our typical ground rules are, I will step aside and just mute myself. Uh, anybody can step in by raising their Zoom hand to get in a queue if there is a queue or just by speaking up if nobody's spoken. Uh, during check-ins, the pausing is very welcome. So we will have some breaks between when people talk. Uh, that is totally groovy. Uh, please only speak once during the check-in round. Don't come in and start a conversation. You can do that immediately when everybody has finished checking in. Also, we desist and we hold off using the chat during this, the, the check-in format so that we can pay slightly better attention to one another. Um, if you have links that you wanna share, like somebody mentions a book or we look it up or whatever else, that is a fabulous idea. Just hold off on those until uh, the check-ins are done and we switch into conversational mode. Daniel, nice to see you. Um, Likewise. Um, I, I think this is your first OGM uh, Thursday call or your first check-in call. First check-in call. Yeah, first check-in call. So I just explained the check-in protocol. Let me go over it again real quick. All of these. Um, no, that's okay. Um, I'm really happy you're here. Uh, I will step aside and not be a uh, traffic controller during check-in. Uh, anybody can check in whenever they want to. Just uh, step in if nobody's talking or if there's a queue, use your Zoom hand raise uh, to step into the queue. Um, and pauses between uh, people checking in are fabulous. Uh, what we'd love to know is what is going in your life or through your mind that is OGME in nature. And... Um, uh, we try to not use the chat during check-in until everybody's checked in. We try also not to check in twice. So just uh, please go once uh, in the check-in round. And then once we're, once we're all checked in, uh, we will uh, go into regular conversation mode and then ch chat is open. Everything is fine. I will step back in to, uh, to manage the conversation. So that being said, I will now mute myself and step aside and see who would like to take us in um, to this week's check-in round. I think I'll uh, start. Um, there's several things going on in my life, which you'll, well, we'll figure all that out later. But something I've read recently um, was very provocative. Um, I know there's been a lot of conversation about how we've all stepped away from nature and separating man from nature, humans from nature, and you know, more things should we should really, you know be more inclusive, but it was a really interesting uh, philosophical argument from a woman I, I met many, many years ago who said that the idea that we would just not differentiate humans from the rest of other species in nature can lead to a, I don't want to say it, put us on shaky ground when we want to be able to encourage each other to be responsible for our own behaviors. Maybe said another way, if we're all part of nature and this is just the way it all works and we're no different than, you know, animals and trees and rocks and whatever, um, the idea that we actually, you know, chit chat about morals and behavior and try and persuade each other to either do or not do things. Um, to my, this woman, Kate Soper, is like, this is, makes us somewhat different than other animals and and we should really, you know, not throw that away. Because if we're all just part of nature and it's all part of the flow, then, you know, nobody's responsible for anything. 
and responsibility is just a human. I mean, we do take responsibility and try to hold each other accountable. And the other part is that there is some work about trying to create, you know, like personhood for rivers and things, which can be quite helpful in curtailing, say, pollution and whatever. But on the other hand, you know, rivers, mountains, rocks, and even my own dog cannot be held responsible for their actions in the way that you can hold me responsible for my actions and what I say and how I say it. And I think the same thing goes for these artificial intelligence language model systems we're involved in. They can participate, you can participate with them, but they cannot be held responsible for what they generate. And this just made me really think, huh, this is worth some mulling over. So that's basically, I've been taking a fair amount of my time. Yeah, I, I really like that. Um, I, I just started uh, participa participation in a, in a new discussion group uh, that was formed by Huda. Uh, she's a systems uh, uh, thinker who uh, located in England, and she started a conversation around health. Um, so Jean Berlinger is part of it. Shimon Waldvogel you know, is part of it. Um, several, um, mostly uh, healthcare professionals, doctors and from, from various uh, uh, parts. And the conversation is about health, um, health in 2024 and beyond. So uh, defining what, what that is. So I'm, I mean, really we're food service professional you know, as part of that discussion group here. Um, but when you when you think about health, um, my my uh, we all we all had to write like an opening statement, and my contribution was that we have uh, lost the connection to health that has been built up from an evolutionary perspective. You know, over thousands of years, women in particular uh, have had an intuitive understanding of what is health. You know what. Uh, how to behave, what to eat, what not to eat. Um, and, and that has been thoroughly disrupted. Uh, and so for, it, it really, the disruption really started in earnest after World War II. Um, <clears throat> and so today, you know, the assumption is that like 70% of the US healthcare bill is uh, related to the nutritional deficit that we, that we have. Um, diabetes, you know, obesity, these are all uh, heart diseases, cancers, these are all nutritional uh, issues, I mean, caused by, by nutrition. Um, and then so Shimon um, is a retired uh, uh, psychiatrist, uh, has been a sort of laser focused lately, and I'm, we are working together on a project to publish uh, you know, uh, uh, some, some articles on this. We already have, have a first article out. Um, he's laser focused on salutogenics. Salutogenics is the, the study of health. Um, so as opposed to focusing on disease and sickness, we're focusing on what constitutes health. How do you, um, how do you protect yourself, live in a healthy world? And much of that, just uh, you know, as, as Bill was pointing out, is we have lost our relationship to nature. So, so the understanding that the pathology is in the soil that are harming the microorganisms inside the soil transfers through the food into our own system. So our gut, you know, our gut biota is a reflection of the microbiota in the soil. Uh, and, the, and much of the pathology that we carry in our modern society is linked to that. So we, we have this, this, direct but not understood link to nature. Um, 
And so the damage we're doing in nature reflects itself in so many different ways that we don't really think about. So that's the, the exploration um, uh, that, uh, that we have in mind. I mean, the participants in the conversation is a director from a, from a hospital uh, uh, system and uh, doctors in different forms. It's, from, it's an international group. So that's that's really a fascinating uh, conversation to have because it's it's when we think about food, there is just so much more you know, than than what meets the the eye when you when you think about this in terms of culture, you know, uh, memories, even cultural memories. When you think about holidays, when you think about foods to celebrate for family events, I mean, there is so much going into this. Um, that that is deep seated, and in particular, um, for for women, you know, I mean, I worked in in, in uh, no, across you know, many countries. When you go into countries where uh, the refrigeration is not very common, and you watch women go shopping for food, it's an amazing thing to watch, right? Because they really have an almost instinctive understanding of you know that they want to touch everything and. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the way they select the foods is basically to protect the family and to bring health back to back home. Now, so anyway, that's um, that's a, a very OGM thing, I think, because you know we're building a chart. You know, Jean is already busy with Kumu and setting up a map and getting this whole thing going. So that's exciting. And from my perspective. Um, we can't change the food system until we change what people think about food. Uh, that you can't change what farmers are doing um, until the public demands something different. And, and so that's the, from my, my perspective, my motivation to participate in there is to create this awareness you know, that food is health um, and that what we eat has so much, so many implications that are reflected in nature directly in nature. I'll uh, do a short uh, check-in. Uh, <clears throat> the last uh, several days, I've been having a lot of conversations about learning and learning in groups and learning in communities and learning in societies and about the possible role of uh, uh, AI in the future of learning. And Yesterday, uh, in an Oracy lab, we had a conversation uh, among six people from six different countries. Um, and at a certain point, I asked the question, uh, do you consider that your country has a learning culture? And everyone said no. As a society, we don't know how to learn. Uh, even in groups that we are involved in, we don't have to learn. So I have a lot of questions about learning and 
teaching and culture and uh, who decides uh, in a culture what can be learned or what should be learned. Is that a role that we dare give away to artificial intelligence? And if we do uh, give it to artificial intelligence, will that improve the learning culture of societies or organizations? Uh, curiosity, we all agreed, uh, leads to motivation to learn, but can you learn? curiosity uh, at whatever age you are? Can it be taught? Should it be taught? Uh, uh, at the moment in our cultures, we've been taught to have the right answers or to be right, uh, and to follow instructions and to follow orders. Uh, and nobody on our call agreed that those were good things to learn. But children, and this was a, a composite of the of the six countries, children are taught not to learn, not to explore, not to ask questions, uh, that they have to memorize things, they have to have a correct answer. Uh, and can we ourselves, with or without artificial intelligence, make uh, powerful interventions in the things which are being taught to children. And just for the reference, the six countries were England, Sweden, the Netherlands, Italy, Lithuania, and America. So my check-in is about questions. Thank you. Uh, I'll go. Uh, hopefully this is the right format. Uh, feedback welcomed. Um, so uh, my check-in is that uh, July is a time of transition for me in a lot of ways, uh, personally, professionally. Um, and uh, a notable thing is that, um, uh, unfortunately, Edvo, one of the projects I was working on, is it's coming to a close in terms of business operations, but potentially going open source, which is very exciting. Um, whatever the case, uh, I remain super motivated to continue my work on the junction of data sovereignty, building thought sculptures, federation, semantic hypergraphs. Uh, and it, it should really come to a surprise. Uh, it should be a surprise to no one uh, that this is a really hard thing to do in a business context. Um, but I'm very fortunate to be able to take the summer off to play and to explore the next form of both Edvo and uh, Hypergraph databases. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm just uh, uh, really excited to turn the page and to, to have a sort of uh, new opportunity to build and create. I'll jump in because uh, what I'm working on, I think, um, might relate a bit to what Daniel just spoke about. <clears throat> For um, a few months now, we've been developing uh, an open source protocols platform, um, which the intention is to um, have protocols replace agreements, which many of us have um contracts uh policies practices many of which are um structured as um there is a, a uh, an author and then someone then agrees to it and uh the person in power has the power to decide what what that um what that agreement or contract looks like um, and the intention is to to build a new culture of uh, 
designing protocols that people adopt. And so um, a set of open protocols that the uh, answer needs. So the structure is need, a set of needs that, that we as humans have um, that different people um, propose different protocols. Those protocols answer the need to the best of anyone's ability. And then those uh, protocols are ad adopted by individuals. Uh, initially, th that adoption will be done on platform um, and, and remain on platform. We'd like that adoption to then move through APIs and other things to people's uh, systems, to their own in-house systems, to their websites and so forth, so that those adoptions become public. Um, and so we're, it's getting exciting because I'm starting to see that it actually looks better than what we'd imagined and is, is actually looking and feeling more like a, um, a platform that, that might succeed at being able to do this. This is not the first attempt at doing something like this. There's been three or four attempts over the years. Um, and um, unfortunately, most of them have not been able to, to get off the ground. We have a different perspective on it. We think it might be a perspective that might make it successful. Um, and the uh, exciting part is is that it's um, a relationship with something I've been working on for years, which is needs, understanding human needs at the neurological level, and uh, and tying those human needs uh, directly to practical needs and those practical needs to protocols um, is something that I'm excited about. So exploring that realm is, uh, is super exciting. What I find um, interesting is that it touches upon a bunch of things that, that uh, has already been said. Hank was talking about learning. Um, we kind of treat these things as proprietary. You know, we've got our agreement and the way we do our agreement and only the, the two parties shall see the agreement and, you know, no one else really. Um, and here, what we're saying is these protocols are open so everybody can see them. In fact, the, the hope is that everybody would publish their protocols so that everybody can learn from them, use from them and, and be able to do that. So talk about asking questions. Um, what's your need? Here's a bunch of protocols and and use them. So I, I love that part of it. Um, the other is, um, you know, Bill talked about uh, responsibility and um, my sense of responsibility from a human needs perspective is that whatever I'm attached to, um, then I have a sense of responsibility. And I think that's no different than animals. Um, if you have, um, you know, a mama duck and it's lost one of its baby ducks, it will chase all over hell to go find that baby duck. It senses a sense of responsibility, right? Same thing with most other animals. Um, so, uh, that, that aspect of responsibility, I think human responsibility is not an intellectual one, um, we have responsibility as a component of our ability to relate with each other. And, and so the more we can connect to each other's needs and to each other, then the more we can actually become responsible. It's not something that we learn. It's not something that we teach. It's something that we have as a possibility if we relate in a way that is more than a transactional relationship. And so that to me is, um, is a, another beautiful opportunity to, uh, to do this. So uh, if anybody's interested in, in uh, working on this project, I'd certainly appreciate uh, more collaborators, but, uh, but it, is, uh, it is something that a few of us are working on and uh, no more lawyers. We already have two lawyers on it. So just uh, let's cut that off. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but anyone else who would uh, find that interesting, would love to to talk to you about it. Thank you.
Well, what I realize after all this time is what I'm really interested in is to know what you all are thinking about climate change. And it's striking that I have no idea. So I'll stop there. Tough act to follow. Right. <laughs> um, and I won't answer because that's not part of the protocol. Uh, uh, I had I had a, a, a small but super fascinating uh, realization this week uh, talking with a, one of our friends, uh, one of OGM's friends, Flancian. Um, we were talking about uh, decentralized social media and like all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and I reflected on what I got out of Twitter and I realized that what I've been looking for in Mastodon or Blue Sky or Nostra or whatever, um, I thought it was interaction because, hey, it's social media, you, you tweet at each other and, and do cool stuff like that. Um, and looking back on my time at Twitter, uh, tw Twitter and I went through a couple phases. I actually was on Twitter super, super early and it was a totally different thing. It was a bunch of friends hanging out, having chats. But the, the main thing of Twitter, the, the thing that everybody knows, in that phase of Twitter, what it was for me was a very, very, very carefully tuned spider web of uh, ways to catch information. Um, and on top of that, a fire hose. Um, fire hose is actually a technical term that Twitter used for like every single tweet. Um, I never, never dipped into that really, but um, uh, a significant amount of the reason that Twitter was interesting for me was because it was so broad and deep and fast. Um, and Flancy and I both realized that our, the way our neurology works, uh, we get more done with what most people would, ex would, would feel like is too much information. Um, uh, I'm really good at being presented with a lot of information uh, and sorting and sifting and finding the stuff that's, that's useful and valuable, finding signal out of a whole bunch of what is essentially kind of noise. Um, so, so now, uh, you know, I, I dipped my toe into Mastodon, Blue Sky, and Noster, um, was dissatisfied with all of them because even though they get better interaction, um, that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for a lot of information, like more information than I ought to be able to, to like sift through and then sift through and get a lot, you know, a lot of value out of it. And it's kind of funny to be in an age where I'm sure there is more information now than, you know, back in the Twitter heyday, three, four, five years ago. But I can't, I feel like, you know, I can see very little of it. Um, it's frustrating all the heck for me. Um, so uh, I just had this epiphany this week. Uh, it, it seems super generative and, and valuable and useful. Um, I've got a few friends who specialize in, in data fire hoses. So uh, maybe, maybe I can find one who's got a lot of data fire hosing through and I can latch onto that again. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this epiphany, but it was, it was striking for me. Um, while I've got the floor, the other thing I'm working on is uh, uh, learning and mentoring infrastructure, um, especially for um, how to work with AI product productively. Um, I, I kind of hope that infrastructure gets repurposed for other things. I think we need uh, more learning and mentoring. Uh, I, I've got an interesting thing where the name I'm using for that is actually coaching. Um, there's, uh, I'm, I'm sure a couple of us are, are uh, good coaches and know lots of coaching stuff. Um, I feel like a, a, a little bit a little bit funny using the coaching term to mean learning and mentoring, but I think that's what I'm actually doing. Uh, coaching is friendly enough and close enough to what I mean um, to peer learning and peer mentoring that I, th I think I'm gonna keep using it. Uh, that's it for me, thanks.
Well, I will jump in quickly. Uh, we've got our philanthropic investment platform up and running, and we've we're going to limit it to three more uh, this quarter to be part of that. With our equity fund, we've got a interfaith um, Delta Interfaith in Louisiana doing broadband, and uh, we're doing Biden climate money. Uh, along with the thing in Jackson and people are on vacation and nobody's moving fast enough. And it's always the same thing. Everybody's agreed. And then they're off in Italy for a week, you know, He's, anyway, I, I really wish the world would move at my speed more often. Um, you know, 1999 was the only time things moved fast enough. And of course that was heading toward a bubble and I was, I, I jumped off, you know, there, there was a time <clears throat> I used to go to a quarry with some other folks and there was a pond next to it. And there, that would create a bubble where you could dance on quicksand if you did it really rhythmically and you left on time. And I really liked it where you could, you know, the ground would bounce in front of you and it was, uh, you know, and, and things would move like that. And then, you know, it would break and Alan Van Etten's brother was always the one who stayed longest and he had to be pulled out all the time, but I was the second and I knew how to jump. And, you know, that was a 1999 kind of thing. And now I'm slogging through everybody's agreed and now they have to work on the protocols. And it, it, this part of the process where they, I, I get them to yes and other people have to, I have to like really manage myself to go quiet and say, speed the fuck up. Can't you see where we're going? And anyway, I'm a little more patient at 74 and a half than I was uh, earlier. But it's just, it's, it's, I just don't understand why the world moves so slowly. So that's all I have to say. And 90, the, the quicksand was an illustration of the dot-com bubble, if that's if that metaphor. That, that's why I told that story then. You know, you, you need to go know when to jump off a bubble, but if you've danced on quicksand a lot, you, you can recognize bubbles and you know when they're breaking. Kevin, if you ever decide to write an autobiography, Dancing on Quicksand would be a really good title. It really works, but it's all a matter of timing. You know, Alan Van Etten's brother, is, he was also the first to die. You know, he, he just was always more risky than everybody. But, you know, he, nothing wrong with dancing on a bubble of quicksand is, and, and seeing it break. You just need to know when it will break and drag you down under, you know. And, uh, anyway. It's an interesting practice. At least to restrain the urge to banter until we're checked in. But oh, was, sorry. But yeah, that was, sorry. But that was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. I realize not everybody gets my, my metaphors and what the context is. So I, I tried to supply that little continuity. Well, I'll go. Um, my wife retired uh, two weeks ago tomorrow, and I'm having sympathetic retirement um, vibrations. <laughs> I haven't done a damn thing. <laughs> I did very, very little last week. I just like you know, I was hanging out and and feel really good. And I'm like, I'm, I, I'm, I have no plans to retire. I, I love the work that I do, and I'd like to work as long as I'm able. Um, but I got to say, it was really great. Just if there wasn't anything pressing. And I'm like, actually, I did something. I, I cleared like 3,000 messages out of my inbox, uh, which was a, a pretty big project. And there's, you know, it's like a thousand left. 
but um, and I know people with like fifty thousand masters, so I don't feel too bad about that. But um, I've really enjoyed just being. Um, surprisingly, although it was really hot here last week, it was actually pretty quiet, and I spent a lot of time on my patio just hanging out, listening to the quiet, staring at the sky. Um, periodic, I go through these periods in my life where I realize I'm full. I, I've I've been reading. I realize I, I've structured my life in such a way that I've been able to read between six and eight hours a day every day since I was a teenager, since I was a kid. And sometimes I'm a little full and I just need to like not take anything else in. So I've been hanging out, listening, doing my Qigong practice, walking in the woods. Um, and it's been really good. Now I got to get back to work. I have a couple of contracts that are on the table. So, um, but it's, I, I got a little taste of retirement uh, and it, it was good. So that's a good place to step in because um, I've been thinking a lot about flow. And um, Bill, I really appreciate you starting off this call. Um, what you and Klaus said really touched me. Um, I've been thinking about the flow of everything, the flow of money and the flow of warm data and the blockages to those things. Um, I'll let that idea sit and just share with you separately an interesting um, disagreement that I had with a like-minded male friend who got upset with me because he didn't like what he called my gender-based perspective. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I had to tell this self-proclaimed feminist that my gender-based perspective from a woman was as equally valid as his was to as a man. So I just wanted to, I figured this is a good place to mention it and uh, I'm complete for now. I'll jump in. Um, first, uh, Lisa, welcome to the call. I don't know that you've been on a check-in call before, so we're in a strange mode uh, that is OGM's check-in, where I don't really control traffic, but we each step in and talk about what's OGM in our lives. Um, and we don't use the chat during this period until we've each checked in one time. Uh, then two other things. First, this is a really rich check-in round. I'm really enjoying it. I'm grateful for how you were all showing up. It's lovely. It's um, I know that the last couple of calls we've been like, yeah, the pauses, the this, the that, but this is just glorious. So I'm I'm felling in it. Um, Doug C, I think you've named the topic for next week's call. Like, what do we all think about climate change? Let's go around in the room and figure this out, and see if we can get someplace uh, together on it. Uh, but that was a, a, a lovely prompt, and I appreciate that we haven't really talked about that in focus that much. So let's let's go there. Um, and then and then what I really wanted to talk about, I'm I'm in the middle of a we uh, existential crisis that I don't know how we it is, but I think that's a way of sort of deprecating it a little bit. Um, partly, I have a tangle of ideas in my head that I think are valuable, but too many of them about too many things. <clears throat> and I get I get caught up in my shorts around trying to represent all of them or or metabolize all of them into something. And they're still inside. They're not really outside in the world. And where they are outside in the world, they are imprisoned in uh, little uh, sort of dead end corners. Like I've been feeding this brain thing for 26 years. The brain is really obscure. Nobody uses it. It has an API, but nobody knows how to get in there. Daniel, if you want to hypertext, hypergraphify my brain, it'd be awesome. Pete has been frustrated in his efforts to connect my brain to GPT. I really like, man, I've got a whole bunch of stuff in there that actually represents what I believe in a beautiful way that scares most people. Um, I'm also writing on Pete's massive wiki, but my pages are just markdown pages on a GitHub repo that nobody knows about. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to get attention there. I've not written a book. I haven't held a retreat in six or seven years. And I know there are people who would love for me to do another retreat. 
Um, there may be something like that in the offing for next year. This weekend, uh, April and I are going to go check out uh, a local place called Naumanu, Camp Naumanu, where um, April bid on um, a couple days at the camp for a number of people. So that might actually turn into a little retreat next year. Um, but I'm, I'm also in my way a lot. I'm also, uh, I do a lot of, um, I, and I can't tell if it's perfectionism, I can't tell what it is, but um, I interrupt myself from being productive, from getting things in the world, and I need to level up. And I'm really frustrated with myself. Um, I'm too comfortable. I don't stretch myself. I don't challenge myself. And I've been my own boss since 1998. So I like to say I've been independent since the last millennium, and I'm a bad boss. Um, I am not very demanding. I'm pretty low key. I'm very happy with life as it as it happens, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm I'm in the middle of trying to sort some of those things out. Um, and if that means I drop out of some of our calls now and then, my apologies. Uh, but I'm trying also to figure out how to you know uh, make a better living out of all this uh, stuff that I do because. Uh, that's I'm I'm so out of the world, out of the arena, that nobody knows I exist to call me up and say, hey, would you come do a talk or something like that? Um, and I think with that, I am complete. Are we following a protocol that I'm not familiar with where we just start if we have our hand raised? Um, Mark, you I think you've been on check-in calls before, but the protocol is we check, we step in by raising our hand or just starting to talk when we'd like to check in. Uh, we're not using the chat and we're checking in only once during the, the check-in round. And once everybody's checked in, we'll go into normal conversation. So I think you're falling in just in the right place. Super. Jerry? I've been in your state since 1984. I know what it's like. I'm coming up to Oregon to the free fair. Um, I got fired from the Internet Archive. And I'm happy about that. Um, I got a severance check. Allegedly 11 grand, but after taxes, seven and a half. But um, fire me again, please. Thank you. Let's see. Where can I start? Um, hmm. For those of you who don't know, D-WebCamp is transformational. And it's a way to meet people from all around the world in a space where you have no traffic in the Redwoods, in an old Boy Scout camp. And I'm an Eagle Scout. And I felt at home there. But I don't feel at home at the Internet Archive anymore. So I'm going to have a dweeb camp, kind of an alternate camp at the beach at Elk, maybe about 12 miles down the road from uh, the Redwood camp. And it's for people who just don't fit, like maybe Jerry. Like, certainly me. Um, I'm a dweeb. I'm, I want a shirt that says dweeb. But you know what? I don't, I don't advertise. I don't sell. If an idea is good, then, hey, take it. Otherwise, don't push me. Don't pull me. Don't make me sell myself. No not who I am. It's not what I want to do. I'm an inventor. I am feeling like I'm finally coming out of my shell after 61 years. And I'd like to make a note. Um, chemo ages your your body and, and, and oddly enough, your brain. 10 years. You're talking to a young man of 61 who feels like he's 25 and parts of me are 75 years old 
in dog years. And that's weird. And it's very cool. I've got some wisdom that it's like, huh. I'm retiring. I'm not going to work anymore. I hated my job. I loved my work. I loved the people and the mission. But you know what? I can live free anywhere. It's so easy. And I was kind of passing by my Arab grocer, um, who's a little high priced, so I don't really go by him. And there was a really beautiful blue green PVC pipe elbow that's about um, six inches in diameter. And it was holding down some newspapers. And he says, or I, I say, hey, how much is that? How much for that? It was twenty dollars. I go, oh my god, I can get that for free. Free? This is America. Nothing is free. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We are the land of the free and the home of the brave. Now, on let's see, what is it? Um, the first of July, I was talking with my doctor, the doctor said, you know, I think the crisis fan should come and check you out. Crisis fan did. I was with my friend Kate, and we were just, you know, having a great time talking with these women, and I went to get, you know, uh, some seaweed to kind of have some lunch. Uh, I buy the seaweed at Costco, and it's delicious. It has lots of glutamates. Um, and I guess Kate was saying something to these women who were concerned, and they're saying, hey, can we go to the hospital? I go, no, no, thank you. And I'm eating my seaweed and standing in the sun. It wasn't really sunny. It's like, sun, like my body needs it. It soaks it up here in San Francisco. I grew up in surf, a surf rat in Orange County, uh, Newport Beach, Costa Mesa. Uh, Laguna Beach, body surfing um, with no wetsuit. Just could do that. Anyway, before I know it, a fire truck pulls up and there's maybe eight, nine people there and then three police cars. And people are saying, you need to get on this gurney and go to the hospital. I'm like, no, I'm safe at home. Please let me go. Just no. Okay. Okay. Pain control. Okay. Oh, oh, handcuffs. Okay. I'm coming with you and I'm committed for 72 hour hold at birth, Parnassus. Um, you know, a 10 minute walk up my street, the emergency room, and then taking a Langley Porter where I really wanted to go in the first place to talk to people about some of the investigations I'm doing about left brain, right brain, and certain neurochemicals. Now, there was a break. Oh, man, I just, it was like staying in a luxury hotel with people who are brilliant artists, but they almost burned down their house because some bit of mania. I'm going, wait a second, I don't have mania. I have emotions, and that's weird to people. I used to be a poet. I can project. I can weep. I can cry. Well, first, um, what is it? A friend died, a dear friend. And I was crying at work. Not like, oh, weep, weep. I was going, <laughs> in drastic pain. And that's not allowed. Folk here in the call, I am diverse. I am the diversity that doesn't really fit in these calls. I discovered that the last call I was on here, it's like, wait a second. I'm being me. Just me. Not acting. You know, it's really difficult for me to tell a lie. I was raised Catholic, very, very strict. And I'm an Eagle Scout. I don't lie. It's weird because it's just not part of the culture that I find myself in right now. 
And that's me. I'm free. I am free. I feel freedom in my bones, in my voice. I see freedom. I taste freedom. I look freedom. I love life. But as a cancer survivor, I don't care if I live or I die. I've lived my life. I'm happy. If I die of a stroke today, I've lived a good life. If somebody tries to kill me, I'll defend myself. I'll even kill them. If somebody tries to kill you, Jerry, I'll stand in their way. I'll stand in I'll stand between you and a bullet. Or them, whatever. No. I love living. I love life. And it's freaking people out. Allegedly, I'm manic. But no. I'm being who I truly am. And it's weird to get the reactions that I'm getting, especially in these phone calls. Now, that's me. I thank you for listening. I'm going to put myself on mute. I'm not going to show the video. I'm going to light a cigarette. And just think about freedom. What to do. I'm heading to Burley which is an hour east of Reading. A friend of mine bought a uh, mortuary. He's a sound artist. And I'm an artist. And I'm just doing art again. It's just, oh my God. <sighs> anyway. Um, on my way up to uh, Oregon, I'm not sure if I'm going to make Portland. Um, I might make um, Port Townsend. Where Mark. again, Malaya. Yeah, I'm I'm almost done. You you Three. were just wrapping up, and it was lovely. And um... four words, four words uh -huh. more. Um, my cousin was the mayor, so um, Jerry, I might be in touch. Thank you very much. Bye bye. I love that, and we're in check in where we shouldn't be conversing. I just want to note, Mark, we love you. You have definitely stretched and pushed the boundaries of participation in OGM on a check-in call. We don't normally do what you just did, but what you just did really explained a lot and shared a lot. You you showed up full-heartedly and um, very honestly, and I appreciate that a lot. Um, and I, apologize. I do have a I do have some closure, Jerry. So after you're finished, just some closure on the fifty-one fifty story. I could um, do it now or after you're done. Why don't you wait until everybody's checked in, please? Sure. No problem. Thanks. Thank you. Um, but now we'll go back and complete our, our uh, check-in round. But but thank you. Hello, good morning, guys. Um, I'm also in Portland, like Jerry. Um, and Stacy, I love what you said about flow, because um, my economic system, the currency system that I'm proposing, I call it a flow currency, actually, because it flows and ensures that everyone can uh, be supported in their life to be able to do what they want. Um, but so I've been working a lot, obviously, on that for a long time. I had a really busy week. I met with, uh, I spoke with um, the uh, the director of the Gassel Foundation. Gassel is a, a, an economist from the, eight, the 19th century. Um, you know, him and my writing partner, we had a conversation that went really well. We kind of compared the two proposals and the differences. Um, so it, it gets at a lot of the, uh, uh, the you know, the details and... Uh, 
So mostly what I've been doing, and I've been doing this for years now, is making a lot of connections, trying to connect with as many people as possible, building my network of not just economists, but game developers, you know, um, all kinds of people. So, you know, podcasters, so just in preparation so that when uh, we have all of our material ready, we have our introduction, the website, um, the book, our summary, the white paper, all of this work is being done at the same time. There's never a minute where I'm not thinking about this system and how we can transition and what other uh, pieces I need. Um, it's really exciting and depressing at the same time. And the excitement comes from mostly from um, discovering more and more people and more and more groups who are endeavoring towards the same direction. They, I seem to find a lot of similarities you know, a lot of people have uh, the same vision. Uh, and this is not new. This is centuries old. Uh, it really goes back to the beginning of recorded history. Everyone seems to want the same things. When you come down to, you know, when you ask people what, you know, kind of world you want to live in, we all kind of want the same things. How we can achieve that, of course, in, a, in an organized systemic uh, way is been the challenge. Um, and so that's really where I've been focusing a lot of my efforts. And I'm close to uh, finally, you know, you know um, I guess really starting, you know, it sounds weird to say that because I've been doing this for a decade now, um, but I, I, I'm at the end point of my work where I, we can finally begin, I think, to, uh, to invite others to digest this uh, and then converse on it. And I have, a, I have this a hope that others will take this uh, new you know, economic system called creditism and begin to speak on it. And so that the world can know that there actually is an alternative to you know, what we've had, capitalism, socialism, communism, they're all what uh, I term and many others call game A because it's fundamentally, it extracts from us, our lives. It takes from us um, and and it makes us fight each other over the resources instead of being allowing us to manage. And so that's where I'm at. Thank you. So I've had um, so many things swirling this morning. <clears throat> I wanted to give myself some time to let it all settle and find, a, if not a coherent thread, at least a few pieces uh, to share with you all. And um, I'm going to share three. Um, I think I mentioned last week, Ken and I hosted a Living Between Worlds call um, a couple of weeks ago, where we talked about how minds change. And I proposed hypothesis, I guess, um, that there are you know, five important driving elements that I see, um, uh, fear and logic, which we live in a lot uh, in how we try to persuade change, uh, and power and desire and dignity. And I find myself in the fear mode a lot these days, uh, in particular looking at the American political landscape. And um, you know, and the um, and the possibility of uh, uh, friendly or not so friendly fascism coming to the United States if we don't win this election in what is it now 107 days? I think something like that. Um, and in that, I'm also really struck at how political formulations are shuffling uh, around the world. Uh, I grew up in a world where um, the Republican right wing in the United States was closely aligned with business. Uh, and that alliance seems to be fragmenting. Um, example of the SCOTUS decision on the Chevron Doctrine to basically eliminate regulation and the Heritage 2025 plan, which wants to eliminate everything, including the Weather Service 
And man, if you're running a business, you want good weather information. And so the alliances are really peculiar. And it harkens me back to what was it, 2010, uh, Prop 23 in California, where a boatload of out-of-state oil interests try to overturn the California energy strategy by referendum. And the political alliance was really unusual. Instead of the usual game of environmentalists and liberals on one side and business and conservatives on the other side, it was environmentalists and business on one side and conservatives and the oil industry on the other side. The business coalition flipped, fragmented, shifted dramatically. And I imagine something like that possible again here. Uh, if we look at the United Front effort in France that turned the election there as another example. Um, and anyway, so where that whole bunch of thinking led to is, um, uh, and this is queuing up next week's Living Between Worlds call next Wednesday, um, is thinking about um, the connection of the moods that we live in, uh, how we interpret the world given those moods, what we, what we see and can see and de deduce from what we're observing, um, and an experiment to take the Danella Meadows um, chart of 12, the hierarchy of the ways to intervene in a system and not take that as an abstract conversation, but as a kind of diagnostic tool to look at what we do, each of us in our lives, in our organizations, and what we might do arrayed against that chart of 12. So it's, uh, it, it's like a lot of the things we do on these calls, it's partly formed and partly not, and will emerge in the conversation. You're all invited. Um, um, second, and this connects to, uh, um, Jerry, your conversation about, uh, about the over, well, overwhelmed fire hose pieces, trying to, you know, trying to move many, many ideas into the world in different ways. So Stacy, what you said about flow, uh, for me, the challenge has been kind of the dance between, uh, um, hmm. What I what I'm experiencing as my as what I'm experiencing as my need for a lot more structure and discipline. I was never a marine. I never learned that game, and I'm finding that I need a lot more of that in my life right now. And I also need a lot more of the intuitive. And those sound like they're in contradiction and attention, but I find them to be a very interesting dance together of how to play those. Um, it's showing up in my coaching work a lot because one of the themes I hear a lot from my clients, and I hear it from some people here, is, is dealing with overwhelm. Um, I've got one client who's so overwhelmed, he's, he, wants, he wants coaching on his overwhelm, and he's so overwhelmed that he can't even make the decision about proceeding with coaching together. So I'm learning about coaching as part of the so-called sales process and uh, uh, you know, being generous and helping people move through what's a really, really common problem for us today. Um, Pete, I used to love the fire hose. I have a different relationship to it these days. Um, and in that um, third piece, um, most of you know, I've been playing in the AI sandboxes a lot the last half year or so. Um, um, both exploring building a coaching tool. So in the the, the URL that's in my on-screen name here has got something you can explore. It's 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 a simulation of me as a coach uh, through an AI. Uh, but I've also lately been working more with uh, AIs as a writing companion. I've been uh, building drafts and taking them into GPT and seeing if it can help me get to polished product. Uh, better, faster, more powerfully than I've done before. Jury very much out on that. Um, exploring another tool that um, will uh, repurpose text into lots of different formats, blog posts, Twitter posts, Facebook posts, LinkedIn's, and you know, different, different, different structures and depths and flavors. And, um, uh, and just started this week to, um, to build, a, to, to turn on the local, local large language models in Obsidian. So aimed at all my work, not at anybody else's. We'll see what comes of that. Last thing in the course of doing that, I've been really struck by um, how to say this. I'm surprised to see a parallel between how humans interact with AIs and how humans interact with humans. Um, and um, 
I will say that we are, uh, uh, in, in my experience, people and people in organizations are not very skilled at making requests of each other. Uh, and people are not very skilled at prompts for AIs. And for that matter, not very skilled at searches, search requests into Google. Um, and I'm really struck by um, a, 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 um, a kind of framework of how to make requests as humans and how to make effective prompts of AIs and how similar those can be. And I'm working on a piece of writing on that that I think might uh, might touch a useful nerve. We will see. Stay tuned to the space on that. Um, and that's it for now. I will just say uh, I've been doing a lot of listening and reflecting, and uh, that's my check-in. And my check-in will be pretty brief. Um, I'm busy, but I'm not feeling like it's very centrally themed. Lots of minor things to deal with in terms of modest home repairs and technicians and people who keep changing the time they're coming, which is perturbing in terms of the discontinuities in my schedule. Uh, all manageable, not serious, just mildly annoying. Um, and we're dealing, I'm not personally dealing with flooding, but there are a lot of people dealing with serious flooding here in Minnesota from the storms in the north. I have a friend who lives, her house is probably 50 feet above the river, but the road to her house is probably 15 to 20, and the road was three feet underwater. Um, so she's had to sort of exit her yard uphill to the next street and do creative things to deal with it. And it certainly it influences my ability to see her as well. Uh, because she doesn't want to take make that trek more than once a day with all the different things she has to deal with with her child who's got volleyball and all kinds of activities so it just seems to me that the world is quite unstable right now and that many of the people that i interact with are quietly disturbed they don't want to talk about it because that makes it debatable or some way more stressful but you can just tell that they're not really at full joy and energy and that's sort of sad. So I'm trying to make sure that I do the best I can to cope. <laughs> so that'll be my check-in.
Looks like John is the only one left to check in. Is that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I am um, just a visitor. Uh, Jerry and I just crossed paths recently, um, and he invited me to come check out this forum. Um, so I I, <laughs> I wasn't planning to, to comment, so I apologize if you're waiting for me. That's okay. If you'd like to check in in any way, if, given what you've seen, that'd be great. Otherwise, uh, we can go on. Well, sure. Well, just by way of introduction, so my, my name is John Thanks. Warner, and I'm an engineer um, and coach and musician and a few other things, father, um, in Central Oregon. Uh, Klaus, you and I have actually met met before, but uh, nice to see you. Um, but anyway, yeah, so just very interested in the overall, um, st you know, state of the world, movement of the world, and uh people's um, participation in the world I, I feel like I can relate to just about everybody who commented and and the the perceptions and things that are going on it's really interesting uh, to see the array of interests and projects and initiatives and whatnot that are going on and, um yeah so just appreciate the opportunity to be here and to to um yeah poke, poke my nose in into the what's going on Thank you. Under the tent. Um, thank you very much. I think, Lisa, you passed on the chat, which is great. Um, I think that's everybody. Cool. I'm releasing the hounds. Uh, Klaus, off to you. Anything you want to put in the chat, please do now. Yeah, I wanted to respond to Doug, who comes up with his normal, uh, no one is talking about climate change mantra. Uh, and I feel all I'm talking about is climate change. You know, so one third of uh, global emissions are caused by our food system. And to change our food system is a, is a monumental task um, that, change, that in, in, uh, involves changing people's relationship with food. Um, so when we talk about health and food, for example, that relates back to you know, how we grow food and, and uh, how farmers interact, you know, working with fewer chemicals, which uh, brings less harm to the soil, which repairs the soil, the entire uh, ecosystem around the soil, the water holding capacity of soil. I'm talking about this all the time, every time. People are getting sick of me talking about it. So climate change is a multifaceted issue you know, that has many dimensions, uh, and and uh, so so I I, I'm, I don't follow what you are what you're saying, Doug, and and because you wrote uh, a book on 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 food, you know, and, and on homesteading and so on as a part of it, so you should be able to relate to it. So anyway, I think we are all talking more or less about making this world more adaptable to the world we live in. Uh, and, and to the environment and to nature. Just wanted to mention that. Thanks for that, Klaus. And, and I think nicely, nicely said. Uh, Stacy. Yeah. Um, well, I heard Doug's question a little bit differently this time. And I don't know if that's partly because his question has changed over the course of time. I heard it as a realization that he's really curious as to what each one of us feel almost on an emotional level. And I don't know if that's true or not, but that's how I heard it. And I think it's an important question because I think there is a segment of the population that will need to get a little bit of fear underneath them. And then I think there's another part of the population that recognizes that fear adds to stress. I mean, we're not all the same. Jose, did you wanna? You're muted, but I just saw you. I'm, I'm trying to get my Zoom to recognize my hand because it no longer oh. gives me a button to push. What? That's crazy. <laughs> sorry. I mean, not sorry. I'm not sorry. Um, but what I wanted, what I wanted to say is, since we were talking about health earlier, one of the things that doesn't come into the health conversation enough has to do with stress, and it's a really, really big deal, and it does play into how we feel about what's going on around us, whether it's politics 
or the environment. So I just think there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. And we don't necessarily know how somebody feels inside about anything. But I just wanted to say that I heard Doug's question differently than I've heard it in the past. Stacey, thank you. And Gil just wrote something similar to that in the chat. Um, Jose, your hand went down. I don't know if that was accidental. I'd love to give you the mic. That right was now. accidental, yeah. Good, good. Um, go for it. Well, I, I, I got, um, I felt much the same as Stacy. That, um, and I think it's what what Doug C has been talking about is super critical. At the same time, I don't think that climate change is the thing that we can touch on climate change comes from everything we've done wrong um and that all of our actions that um that we have taken as societies around the globe have created it and we can't fix it because it isn't a single problem by addressing it um I think the work that we're doing, all of us collectively in different areas, are in part directly or indirectly uh, trying to address that. And so, you know, I don't talk about climate change um, because I I have nothing to do for directly with climate change, but I talk about trying to put people in a place where they can do better work that isn't creating more problems. Um, because when we're working for an organization that's creating climate crises, that in itself is the problem. And so how do we do things differently in a way that doesn't contribute to this big thing? It may not be that we can address the problem directly. And I, I hear from Klaus, from others, that everything we're doing is in some way um, kind of addressing that. Um, what what uh, Ramsey was saying about, um, you know, how we compensate the world, we're all chasing the mighty dollar and we'll do things that we don't, we know aren't good for us. We do things we know aren't good for other human beings. And we do things that aren't good for our ecology because we're chasing the mighty dollar. So how do we fix that? Uh, so to me, everything we're doing is, in essence, actually trying to solve that problem indirectly. It appears we have begun next week's conversation already, which is great. Um, Mr. Carranza, you had asked if you might conclude your statements earlier, and I would like to give you that opportunity if you will mind the uh, mind the envelope that you are inside of here. And you may have stepped away from your desk. So uh, let's go to Bill and Pete. Bill, you're muted. <clears throat> you took down the hand, but not the mic. Yeah, one day this uh, technology will actually adapt to humans. Someday. Uh, um, so I just wanted to say something I heard from Jose when you mentioned a little bit, when I mentioned this thing about what I've been reading, about how you really can't, for example, take a river responsible for over make it overflowing its banks. Or when I was reading this little book, or you know, the choices my dog makes. And I think what this woman Kate Sofer is and others have argued is that there's something special about humans that we can't throw away just by saying we're just the same as all other species. Because in a way that takes all responsibility away from us from what we do and what happens from what we do. And responsibility and these you know, conversations we have about morality, are question, these are conversations we have amongst ourselves. And as far as I can determine, you know, dogs do communicate with each other. They know how to manage their space. They know how to like, you know, be nice or not, but they don't have conversations about morality. And this is something, I mean, in a way, it's a little bit of a nit, but the idea about being of being aware that we are part embedded in this nature, you know, we can experience about, you know, well, you know, pay attention to your breathing. There you go. But 
there is something that we can't throw away that we as humans need to basically convince our, each other and ourselves to either to behave differently like keep the oil in the ground or you know whatever but those are big but we we you know it's sort of like there is something special about us that we, we need to we can't erase just by saying we're all one with everything i mean there's more to it it's this is more sophisticated i've only just read this a couple of times thanks bill i just uh do i have the right philosopher in the chat there yeah okay good thanks uh pete please uh thanks i and and i guess i have a couple of responses. I the I, I think what Bill said was something like so. Uh, I, I appreciated uh, uh, Jose. I think uh, was the the mama duck uh, and the baby duck uh, scenario, which uh, the mama duck has a responsibility there. It makes a lot of sense. Um, there's something different when uh, you uh strip mine or or pull petroleum out of the ground or you know something like that there's a different kind of responsibility that i think um bill's bill's analysis is that humans some humans have a way of saying well we're just you know we're just the ducks are people we're people people don't take need to take responsibility for big things like that and when when humans start to change the world in ways that are injurious to maybe other humans or especially to other other residents of the planet then you're starting to take responsibility for you know your you, you need you should take responsibility for your action um i also i, I guess <laughs> i guess it's me and jose i i have another couple of things i'll say um and I, i'm not picking or anything like that i i uh, love what you're doing with protocols uh and i'm engaged or i'm excited to send you an email and say Oh wow! Wow, protocols. Uh, there's a whole amazing story of the uh, the way the internet was invented and and constructed back in back when the IETF uh, was a big force. Um, and the there's a couple simple rules rules and protocols uh, of how the rules and protocols for the internet were developed, uh, and they're brilliant and and they were used used very well and uh, created a wonderful thing. So I'm I'm interested. I'm excited to kind of join you. Uh, the the other thing, Jose, that you said, um, uh, I I'm in the same boat uh, with Doug's question. You know, it's like, well, I don't have anything directly to do with climate, but I I am helping the heck out of a bunch of people who can then, you know, uh, work better in bioregions, decentralize better, communicate better, just make better decisions together. I I kind of hear Doug's question and his, the way he continues to ask it as. <laughs> You know, even if you think you don't have anything to do with climate, by golly, this is the the time to fish or cut bait, right? Uh, I I think Doug's call is for every literally everybody to decide now's the time to act on climate, or you know, or what the heck are you doing? So uh, I I hear Doug's question and and I have that stock answer. I am working on the the climate indirectly, and I also wonder if that's enough. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Uh, thanks, everyone, for these reflections. Um, I have a question standing in my brain that fits the duck drama story, especially as we head toward um, strip mining, <laughs> uh, just to weave a little thread through our conversation here. But um, my, my, um, my question is, does, does fair capitalism actually pencil out? Can capital the, the reason there's strip mining, the reason the reason people do awful things to other people into the into nature is that they believe, and they're often kind of right, given the the situation on the ground where they are at the time, that unless they do those things, there will be no business that the thing they're trying to do can't happen, won't happen. Um, uh, in the early uh, conversation about the era of steam and the invention of the steam engine, uh, coal is free at the coal mine face. So the first steam engines are used there where fuel is free to pump water out of coal mines because they're having they're they're mining out all the stuff all the coal, coal coal that's on the surface in England and they have to go deeper so they have water problems. It's pragmatic, it's simple, it's like oh the economics just 
barely make it. And the earliest dimensions can barely lift their, you know, their, their weight or their worth. And then everything gets better and changes. So we talk about fair trade, we talk about all these things. Does a capital, is there a form of capitalism where everybody's treated well, that is economically sound, that actually works? And I'm unclear that that's true. Um, so just a thought for someone to ponder. And if someone has a, an answer to that in some philosopher or economist's point of view, I'd love to see it. Um, Gil, please. You're muted. I raised my hand for something else, but I'll answer your question. Please. No. Awesome. So why are we still doing it? Well, no. So let me let me let me just not be flip and say a little bit more. Uh, okay, good. There's, there's lots of concern about this. The conversation is much wider than it's been at any time in my life in all kinds of circles, including even like the Wall Street Journal, for God's sake. Um, and there's lots of efforts to reform capitalism with stakeholder capitalism, conscious capitalism, and ecological capitalism, and so forth and so forth. And I would argue that none of these get at the at least six structural defects that are embedded in the system. And then unless we address those six, um, we don't we don't answer your question. If we if we can address those six within a different capitalism, maybe, but not without addressing those. Um, and um, thirty seconds: uh, accumulation without limit, extraction without reciprocity, alienation without care, abstraction without ground. Um, generation without regeneration and privatization without solidarity. And I can go into more detail on that in another call if people are interested in doing that. I've got some writings on that, but that's what that that that's that's my position. I'm sticking to it for now. My other the reason I raised my hand was um, was question to Jose. When you say protocols, I hear um, agreement templates. And I wonder if you're talking about something other than that. Maybe that's a conversation for offline. Um, but um, so I'm curious about that. Thanks, Gil. Uh, Jose, you had your hand up earlier and you've been having hand trouble this call. So I'm wondering if you wanted to step into the queue before Klaus. If not, we'll move to Klaus. And then maybe Ken, for a, if you have a poem for us uh, today, that would be great. Um, please, Klaus. Yeah, I, I think looking at the, the history of capitalism, um, and you look in the 1930s and the reforms that came out of the 1930s, uh, you know, banking regulation, the regulation of the news media and so on, it can actually work. And uh, if, it, if it is well regulated and if it has uh, good intentions, if it's ethical, you know, um, I mean, unfortunately, since Reagan, all of these protections have been dismantled again, and we're falling back into the same circle of uh, uh, making capitalism lethal. Now, as Karl Marx predicted, and uh, now as human nature seems to seems to uh, revolve around very specific patterns. But I also think the only viable way to get out of the mess we're in is by creating incentives for people to do the right thing. And that requires a regulatory frame, you know, that gets us back into where we where we were you know, during, during the last crisis. Thanks, Klaus. Um, let's take your breath and uh, Ken, whenever you'd like. I just want to add one piece to what Klaus said and just say that I agree with the incentives and let's just keep our minds open to other incentives in, in addition, like social incentives that we could do in our own little circles. Not every incentive has to be money-based. I just wanted to point that out. So this is a poem by Christopher, Pry Christopher Fry. It's called The Sleep of Prisoners. The human heart can go to the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this, this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries breaks, cracks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flows. The thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to face us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul men ever took. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise, 
is exploration unto God. What are you making for? It takes so many thousands of years to wake, but will you wake for pity's sake? Thank you so much, Ken. As always, the poem hits the spot. Thank you. I thank you all. I, I will go with the climate change topic for next week. I'll send out the invite now so we can all think about it and figure things out. Um, Doug, feel free to write on the list or ping me. Ken, you have something to add? Yeah, um, I'll send this to the, I'll post it in Matamos and, and send it to the OGM list, but there's a beautiful TED talk by a woman who's um, got a wonderful Venn diagram of make your own, decide how you want to handle climate change. What do you do? And it, it's it's a fun exercise. I think it would really be cool if people would do that before we came to the the call. So right. it'll take you 10, 15 minutes, but um, to, I think it'd be really worth it to uh, prepare ahead of time to have a little bit of, here's what I can do about climate change. Can you post that to the OGM list? Yeah, I will. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, Mark Carranza, would like to sing a song. I'd like you to all join in. Stand up. Mark, Mark. Take a deep I, breath. Mark, Mark, I invited you in a little earlier. We're a little over time. And I'd love to wrap the call or let everybody um, uh, wrap, you know, go in back to their days. I appreciate this, but. Um, Does this call need to end? Uh, at this point, yes, I need to get back to. Um, Can to someone change the something of the call and let it flow? not stop the people who still want to keep talking can keep talking the people who want to turn off the call take a deep breath get the breakfast get the work done go uh, can there be an after call in 